You are listening to the Head Hunting Housewives podcast with your recruiter, Diane O'Brien, episode number 70. Hey, everybody, this is Diane O'Brien, your Head Hunting Housewife. So, as you know, I am new to podcasting, but the one thing that has made this super simple for me is this app called Anchor. <laughs> so, if you're wondering how to start a podcast, because that's what I Googled, how do I start a podcast? I thought to buy all this equipment, or I saw lots of YouTubes and all these things you had to get first. But luckily, I found Anchor and I put the app on my phone and it was easy and I started recording. So, uh, so far, so good. And we'll let you all know how to do that as well. Good luck. Good morning, Headhunting Housewives. It's your recruiter, Diane, here on this June morning. It's beautiful, and it's funny. I'm thinking about how in years past, I'd often get up in the morning and spend time thinking about attracting clients. I've been sitting here this morning trying to figure out how to attract this bird in my backyard to befriend it <laughs> and for it to get closer to me. My dad had a bird that actually landed on his shoulder when he lived in Argentina, and I've had that, I think, fantasy of mine where I can get one of these birds in the backyard that I see on the daily to befriend me and land on my shoulder. It has not happened yet. I'll let you know if that happens. <laughs> but um, the reason I was thinking about that is I've been thinking a lot about all of you out there today and you know the past few weeks. And as you know, we're in summertime. We're in the middle of June already. I mean, literally, I think today is what, June 15th. Um, I feel like June just got here and here we are. Your kids are probably out of school and you should hopefully be in summer mode um, and creating that space to enjoy the summertime. And what's really nice about that is that um, when you create that space for yourself, you really get to see where you are, where you want to go. And I've been thinking a lot about all of you um, more than usual lately in your recruiting role and how you're going to build your businesses, especially since I've been getting better analytics back on, um, all of you who are listening and hearing more from you. And, um, I know a lot of you are, you know, either a recruiter in a company that hasn't hit six figures yet. They're starting your business or want to start your business. You want to become a retained recruiter. So you're really still striving to get to a place where, um, Everything that's still a hustle or still a struggle can become a lot easier and you can attract the clients that you want to attract and have an easy candidate flow and have the contracts flow easier and just have business run smoother. And that's why I'm here to help because I feel like it took me so many years to figure out an easy path for easy flow. And then one day when it hits, it just feels like a miracle, but you can look back and really kind of see your own breadcrumbs of what you did here that worked and what you did there that didn't work. And literally, I can look back on years of my recruiting life and and think, I wish I would have known this then. Um, so what I want to talk to you about today is one of the number one topics that seem to get the most attention, whether it be on YouTube videos or podcasts I've done or even mentoring just with clients in the past or candidates. And it's always about um, att- attracting clients, everything client related. It's finding clients, it's keeping clients, it's how do you get client referrals. Um, that and of course process seems to be another hot button um, that I want to think more about for you to kind of give advice on how to have you think about that now, especially for those of you that are, whether I want to say younger, but maybe it could be younger or just less experienced. You could be my age or older and just starting out, um, which would be the same thing. I can give you all those tidbits. Um, or for those of you that are young or out of college and um, have become recruiters or want to really grow your game. So I want to talk about um, lessons learned in clients, everything clients. Um, and so I'll do little sessions on these, just like other COO clients uh, stories I mentioned from the last time. I think wherever um, my mind takes me this summer is where I'll kind of help lead and maybe give advice that could maybe help all of you. Um, but as far as the clients um, finding and attracting and keeping clients, what I want to start with here is that, you know, through your career, that's probably going to shift. I know that has for me. There were things that worked really well for me when I started my career that later in life either didn't serve me anymore, wasn't working anymore, and I had to kind of shift and find new ways. Uh, a good example of this, I can think not only as a young recruiter, but as a young sales girl, 
the way you would find clients is you would cold call, right? And so I remember back in the day, you know, my mornings would be filled with cold calls. I mean, true cold calls, calling into companies and calling into HR and doing these cold calls that were kind of brutal in many ways looking back. You know, it's like a boiler room where you're just, you know, dialing for dollars. And yes, it worked. I mean, my sales days, I had to put a lot of calls to hit the number I needed and same with recruiting. Um, but it definitely was the tougher way of doing it. And I don't know if everyone needs to go through that learning lesson to jump then into easier ways. If it's almost like you have to cut your teeth on that similar in a similar fashion of where maybe every recruiter has to be a contingent recruiter where you're only getting paid when you hire versus a retained recruiter where you're actually getting hired from the onset to partner with a firm. Um, so I don't know how everyone's path has to be. I hope you can jump past all the hard stuff and get right to kind of what I found to be a very easy path now. So I want to share that with you. But even if you have to go through the hard stuff and you are a contingent recruiter first and you are still doing cold calls and these things, um, I think there's still easier ways of doing it than maybe, um, how you first started. Um, and you know, I can speak to that a little bit. I used to, in my book, work from home headhunter, you know, I definitely spoke about making all cold calls warm. So even if you're in that cold call stage of finding clients, there are things you should be doing to make sure it's not a pure cold call out of the blue. Like I would always make sure to email first. Nowadays, it'd be more almost a text if I can, um, you know, or it would be um, making sure it's a referral through someone you know. So it's not a real cold call, but so-and-so introduces you. Um, I'd say all of my clients just about now, I hate using the word all, but like 98%, let's say, um, you know, are referrals. Therefore, they've already been introduced to me. So my first call with them, like my introduction call, um, isn't a cold call. It's a very warm call. They've sought me out and they were introduced to me and, or they didn't maybe seek me out, but they sought, um, uh, recruiting help out and the person they reached out to referred them to me. Right. So they come to me that way. Um, so very different than cold calling back in the day. Um, but there are some things I can share with you that are the same, like for that first introduction call, when you, you know, do all your cold call work and you finally get someone hot on the line, then how do you handle it? Right. And that would be the same as today for when someone, I didn't have to do any work for it, but somebody was referred to me and I have an introduction call. How does that call go down? What does that look like? So I'll speak about that. But also, um, you know, and how I said changes through the years, you know, from cold calls, I remember after, you know, years of doing that and that wasn't, it was working, but I was tired of it, I guess you could say, you know, I wanted something different and also better clients. I felt like I wanted to make more money. That's, I think at the time when I wanted to get more into retained and more into higher level executive searches, um, from just whether it was recruiter or sales, um, hiring and all that stuff. Um, and so I would start going to conferences and I think from cold calls to conferences, I wrote a lot about that in my book as well. Um, which is still a great way. I know a lot of retained recruiters still get their clients from conferences because you can go to conferences. I mean, every month and every day, probably a week, there's these giant conferences going on in every industry. So you can really infiltrate a niche by going to all those conferences, whether you're in healthcare or clean tech or software, there's a million conferences. And now, of course, with, you know, in the past with COVID, they all went online. I mean, some of the clients I had that I used to work with for BizDev that put on those events, they took it all online last year, the ones that stayed in business. And so it's almost easier than ever, you know, before I would schlep around to fly across the country, which at the time wasn't schlepping. It was really fun. I was you know, getting paid to fly everywhere and and racking up miles to use for my family travel later, meeting clients, you know, it was kind of um, a little bit easier, especially back then being one of the fewer, I feel like women in the different industries on executive recruiting, it was very easy to attract clients and then and follow up to close deals. Um, But even from then, that seemed like kind of the cream of the crop. But then later, I didn't want to do all that travel, right? So then how do I find clients? And that's later when I, after writing a book more and doing more social media, and doing a lot more mentoring just to become an expert in the field, that's when the whole client attraction started. That's when referrals started coming in. And so it does shift your career. And remember, wherever you are at your stage, it's okay. And wherever what feels right, you, I think you have to learn certain things to jump to the next level. Hopefully, you'll be wiser than I did and jump a lot quicker. It won't take you 10 to 20. <laughs> I feel like at what point it took me to make each jump, if it was five years, 10 years, 15, um, just to get to a place of, of complete ease. Um, and then also keep in mind your recruiters out there. You know, I find I look at different comments sometimes or people say, oh, that doesn't make 
any sense or that's not true. You can't get clients that way. Be careful because, you know, I used to think the same thing back when I was starting out in cold calling. I'd say, yeah, right. Sure. You're going to sit back and do nothing and attract clients. And I would think that wasn't true. And I've had people comment that there's no way in my 20 years of recruiting, this is someone else saying this, you know, or in a comment, you can't just get clients and wait for them to come to you. You have to constantly cold call and go after. And I used to think the same thing, but later again, you will have, I have more inflow in my LinkedIn alone, much less other areas of referrals, my networking partners that I work with now and actually give percentages to, to refer my way as well. Um, for the clients I've worked with for the years in different industries that, you know, it sets up, you set yourself up in a different manner. So all things are possible just because you haven't hit that level yet or wherever you are. Don't think that that's not waiting for you. And you can actually start putting in, um, the groundwork for that now, especially ladies that are young recruiters or, or less experienced, you might be cold calling your day, but still have an eye to maybe then doing the whole going to conferences or networking with other uh, recruiters that can, um, you know, refer to you that's if it's not their niche, but it's in your niche. And um, maybe becoming an expert, again, doing the blogs, or if you can write a book, or, you know, all these things are going to lead to uh, client ease and, and an easier way to attract clients later on. So that can all happen, you know, organically. Um, and then, of course, if you're not in your own business, a lot of you, if you ever have trouble with that side, you can always dip back in to working for a company that needs you. I've gotten calls the years where a call came at the right time, where I was maybe having a slow time with client attraction. And I'm like, okay, I'll go work for this company. And it was a great way of getting paid um, you know, as a contract worker, still through my own business, um, almost always, but you can kind of dip in in either way that you need. And then you can have lots of clients in a brand new industry. I did that insurance for a while or finance. And all of a sudden I had this wealth of knowledge in a new industry, which later in making placements there for the company, later they call you. Um, now for some niches that I didn't want to stay in, I kept referring back to those old friends and then guess what? They refer to you. So anyway, there's lots of way to get clients, but I want to focus back if you're young, experienced or new to when it's a complete struggle. Cause I remember those days and that's what I want to get you out of as soon as possible. So, you know, you're doing the, let's say the hard cold calling or, um, you are going to conferences, let's say, right. And then you have all these follow-ups you have to do because a big part of having a client or attracting, getting a client is in the follow-up. And that's a really big key. Follow-up, follow-up, follow-up. Because I think even at the time, you know, I knew as a sales girl and in cold calling, I learned from, you know, my younger days at GE or wherever that you have to follow up. You can't just like meet someone and expect them to come back to you. You have to follow up on the weekly, right? And even at conference, I would go to conferences and think, okay, they're just going to call me now. No, I would come back with a hundred business cards and then I was at my desk for a week to two each morning and do follow-ups, right? You would send an email here and an email there. And then even, and you know, a few weeks later, those all don't come through. A lot of those clients don't come in until like a year later. I mean, I hate to say that because I know that sounds like, oh, you're kidding. But that's just the way it goes. You'll have some right away. So, you know, focus on those, but then you would be still kind of keeping in touch with those other clients, um, you know, so that they remember you in a year from now. And of course there's, you know, software you can use now. You can use Marketo and all these marketing things to do a, a slow drip and these cadence emails. And you can use, you know, the entreports of the world, like for your, um, you know, just kind of keeping track of your customers and just emailing them weekly. And, you know, I've kind of like, I've been there and done a lot of all that and, um, and kind of come full circle. Some of that stuff I still use in little ways. Some I just don't anymore. <laughs> and just let whatever comes to me organically come. And if not, fine. Just because like, I, you know, go after the bigger paying clients. Um, so I can take on a lot fewer than I used to. So, you know, you're going to have all these different ways of kind of having different drips or hustle. Um, but then once you have that client, so we talked about follow-up, follow-up is important. You get them now, right? And they want to talk to you and they have a deal they want to speak to. And now you need to get them. I mean, you've attracted them or you hustled for them and now you need to get the client, right? And first of that, first of that starts the conversation. Of course, there'll be follow-up emails and then you'll get, you'll get to the contract. And I'll kind of walk through all these steps here on this or another podcast. But as far as on the call, um, and again, I'm bringing kind of a wealth of knowledge over from when I was young and doing it the wrong way to how I feel like I do it now. 
and you know just all the experience in between um, that I'll share with you, as well as even sharing. You know, I have mentors now that are trying to get me to the next level. They're telling me what I'm doing wrong and how I should do better to get now the more hundred thousand dollar client, right? And so, um, you know, my highest contract I ever put together was for ninety k. Mine still run probably between forty five sixty. I'd say you know being the average sixty is a nice sweet spot for me. Um, I do lose some clients that I know there are a lot of referral or team retain recruiters that are going lower than that to get the deals. Um, but there are plenty of retained out there at the 100K that are also getting it, right? So it's where you're comfortable. So um, we'll talk about the contracts later and how you put those together and what makes sense for you. And then, of course, your client at the time. I still go, you know, I mean, just a couple years ago, I was doing way less just to help a woman-owned CEO hire recruiters. And that was in my wheelhouse. I love hiring you recruiters. And so when that comes along, um, I go for a lower contract because then I can still, when you guys come to me and you have a recruiting job, I had a client and I have a constant referral source the other stream, the other way of referring your recruiters to companies that need to hire recruiters, but I maintain that. Um, so anyway, when you get on the phone with your client, there are some things that I just found that work for me. And, and again, this could be many calls into itself. It's just, you know, it's like the art of the deal in a way or how you um, start the call or how you finish it. Is it on the phone? Is it a Zoom? So for me, again, I'm doing the kind of going through all of that. I really just try to cater to what the client wants. So in the years past, I would just do it one way or then it was all the other way. Like it was always on the phone or then it, I always made sure it was a Zoom for the face-to-face. -face. Now I'm pretty chill and laid back and just want to do whatever that client wants to do. So I'll literally ask them um, whether it's the CEO reaching out to me or his assistant, if they want to do a phone call, if they prefer Zoom, you know, I give times I'm available to try to find what's convenient for them. I mean, I kind of, my work feels like a lot of play in many ways. So I don't have a really set schedule when it comes to like I used to as much like here, this is the day for my client calls. This is the day for my Zoom. Um, you know, I went through a period of, of massive structure that I needed and then it kind of flows easier. I think because the structure's all there, it just doesn't feel like structure anymore. It's like when you create a habit and it was so hard creating it, but then once it's there, it's just in the background. You almost forget that you created that structure. So I'm sure that's in the background still for me, but it's not like set days. So regardless, go for what bit is easy for them, right? If they're using that, is it that calendar? There are certain like calendar things they want you to invite on their calendar. I had one CEO that she wanted me to put on her calendar. I'll do that. If they just rather, um, I have other clients that like, does me to call their cell, do that, right? Other ones always do want the Zoom, set up the Zoom. <laughs> so do what your client wants. Again, you're catering to your client. And that's kind of key in all this to get great clients. I mean, they, you should treat them, um, you know, they're your baby, right? So kind of give them what they need, not what you need. So start with that, you know, um, that's why you do the follow-ups too, that what works for them. Um, but when you're on that first phone call, so let's say, you know, let's say it's not a Zoom and they just want to do a quick phone. Let's say they want, they're asking you to call their cell um, and they were referred to you, you know, and, or, you know, you cold call, but now they want to have a call with you. And it's basically an introduction call. So remember the, these calls to kind of give you a little more detail. We are, we are here on Tactical Tuesday, I suppose, <laughs> even though it's summer. But um, just to give you more detail, you know, keep those calls, I would say, to um, you probably set up for like a 20, 30 minute. Sometimes they go a little longer, and especially if the client wants to go longer, up to 45, you know, someone to go an hour. And I, I never go past an hour because my ADD kicks in anyway. But really just for timing, it's made sense for me not to go past an hour. Really 30 minutes is the sweet spot for intro calls. Um, you know, and call intro, I say, you know, it's like 15 and 15, but really the intro for you is going to be like a few minutes, but still the whole giving your background and speaking about things, I kind of call that the introduction, right? So that 30 minute call, it's like, you know, probably 15 minutes, you're, they're talking 15 minutes, you're talking or between the back and forth. Um, but for you to introduce yourself, make sure your little, um, go back in the days with the elevator speech I would speak about, right? Make sure it's really short and sweet. Like this is what you've done. This is where you've been. This is, you know, how you can help when you're referred. It's a lot easier. I almost forget my original elevator speech now because when people refer me, they kind of look up my background online and they kind of can see the LinkedIn referrals or looked at websites and just see that I have a history. So they're not so much wanting to dig in and making sure I can do it. They just want to make sure, you know, what the breadth of experience is. They'll often talk about what niche they're in and my experience there, you know, on recruiting and, you know, those kind of things. But for you, if they don't know you from Adam, you will have to speak more to how long you've been recruiting, you know, the jobs that you've hired for, um, and the process. And I still, still focus on process, of course. So keep in mind that the call will shift depending upon how they're coming to you. But then again, some things stay the same. So 
once you have them, once you introduce yourself and you have a quick little clear two minutes on who you are and, and why you're doing what you do, um, you know, you can give like some examples of who you recently are hiring and your process, of how you do it. That's one thing they all want to know is your process. And I'll tell you, all of them, I think when they're speaking to different retained firms or different recruiters, or even if you're contingent, they're going to want to know kind of what makes you different and why you use you, right? What's unique about you? Um, and I think I've felt different ways about this at different times of my career. I've gone from being like, this is why I'm so unique <laughs> and these are my reasons to then thinking, oh my gosh, I don't even feel that unique anymore. Sometimes I think about how recruiters do it and the great recruiters out there all probably do the process a little bit of a similar way. So I almost felt like, okay, the best ones out there are not that unique. We're all following a great process. But then I go back to thinking, well, no, it is still unique because you're still bringing your personality to it. You're following a pro- proven process that works that maybe other firms also follow, but there is some secret sauce in you that makes it work, that makes you unique in how you close the deal. Um, for me, especially lately, it's, you know, very fast and getting to the right person quickly. And in my niche, isn't so much an industry anymore, but the niche of matching that CEO to that CEO they're looking for, um, in a way that just makes the perfect fit. And, and so anyway, you'll want to basically speak through, um, and it is wherever you are, right? You can't, even though I'm giving you examples of where I've been, how I do it now, you really can't cookie cut that. It's going to have to be the truth to where you are and what's working for you. And truth is a big one talking to a client because you have to speak to where you are and what you're good at and what you're not and just lay it on the table because people can smell if it's not being real, right? And I think what's helped me and what's served me throughout my career is just that element of this is who I am, this is where I am, whether it's good or bad, whether I'm succeeding or failing in many ways, I kind of give that on the table. It probably hurts me. Sometimes it probably turns off certain clients, but I found that's okay because it'll turn on the right clients that I want to attract. It'll, you know... um, There'll be something in my speech or something that I'm saying during that dialogue that that makes sense to them and it just clicks. And I think for me and looking back, it's really been a trust factor and just an honesty. You know, I've had clients that later told me when I asked them, well, why did you choose me? I knew you could have gone with higher end clients like the Hydras and Struggles or Christian and Timbers in the day um, or the corn fairy, and there's these big retained clients. Why would they pick me over that? And often it's because they just trust I can do the job and they know that I'll stick with them for the long haul. And that I think trust is the key word. So before I'm saying follow up, follow up, follow up, you know, now it's like trust, 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 honest, truth, trust. You want to gain, um, their trust. And you do that just by being honest by, with what you do and how you do it and examples and referrals of, or not so much referrals, but references of happy clients. And that's why they were referred to you, right? So there's an element of trust already, but that's going to be really key. So that's, I think a good tidbit there. The other thing I remember on that call as you're going through things, um, is really don't, you know, when I say an intro in the very beginning, it's going to be short and sweet. Like, like I said, the tuna elevator speech, beats part of your intro because you really want to get into finding out more about them and and having good questions. And I have the years I've had like a list or one page of questions and those have evolved through the years as well. But I can also um, share that just like the basic questions you want to ask. And it shifts because obviously like now I'm asking more, like I said, about um, what they're doing in revenues and how many um, employees they have and getting into what they're looking for a COO. Um, but if you're hiring a recruiter team for a company or which, you know, or a sales team, you're asking more about their territory and maybe just the revenue for that territory and, you know, number of clients that are in their current installed base and how much they want to grow it to. So there are all these different questions, but they're kind of around the same thing, right? Whether it's the territory or the, if it's a recruiter's, um, book of business or whoever it is, could be finance person, insurance with their, with their revenues or their, um, book of business is right now where it needs to go. It could be quotas we're talking. So it's going to be around the money, right? So whether, however format that is, um, you're going to get to what they need that person to be doing and where it needs to go usually and who you're hiring. So, you know, that's definitely one part of the conversation. Um, and then, you know, it's the numbers in general, um, whether it's on um, the money and revenue or employees, just um, maybe where they're at, your client, where they need to get. Again, this will be at different levels, but that's something you're going to want to talk about and have a really good understanding of. Um, of course, not just, you know, the numbers and money, but the other big thing is the culture. You know, as you're establishing trust, you're wanting to learn more about their companies. You're asking them things. And again, it depends how deep you go. If you're 
hiring for a customer service rep, you're not going to ask how their company got started. But when I'm talking to a CEO of a company he started maybe five years ago, I want to get a quick feeling for, you know, what got him into that, how he got started, you know, how he hired the employees he hired so far, um, you know, how he's done that, if he's used other recruiting agencies, what has he liked, what hasn't he liked. So I'll go deeper with the CEO than I will if, if you're talking to an HR person just for one hire. So, um, so, but you want to focus on, again, the questions that are relevant to that client. So that's what you have to always think of. Who are you speaking to? Who is your audience? You know, how can you help them? You know, what they're not, when they're coming to you, what are they looking to hire? And then how can you dig deeper on that a specific hire to get to know kind of what you need to know to go to attract the perfect candidate for them, right? That's the key of it. So you're going to be asking lots of questions. You're in discovery mode, like a lawyer, right? You are learning about that client. So you know, doing all these follow-ups to get them, you're establishing trust, and then you're questioning, you're learning, you're just asking questions to learn. And of course, they'll be asking questions about you because they're learning about you and want to trust you also before they would give you a search. And really in this first introductory, you know, fact-finding mission of this 30-minute time frame, or maybe you have only 15 or 20, very quickly, you're going to have to figure this stuff out, establish trust, and even enough information to hopefully float a contract by after that first call to then quickly schedule up a follow-up call to where you actually help close them, um, which is usually that second call the following week, um, if not after the first one. And we'll talk more about then how what you float in that email, what that contract looks like, what the process sheet looks like. If you do a profile sheet, there are these like little follow-up sheets you can pass along that are very helpful. And then some things that I do, kind of my, I feel like, secret to success that didn't feel like a secret, just felt natural, maybe from my sales background, but I definitely think when I look back on clients, I close the quickest. I kind of had that process in place where I'm giving them a lot of freebies. Like I think about recent clients um, that it just came very natural to where they didn't have their job description. A lot of clients do, especially the CEOs. But the ones that didn't, that I actually, you know, I don't write their folder job description for them, but I have templates I have that I forward over and I can basically help them put that together pretty quickly. And it feels like a freebie to them, you know, so these are some things you can put in a follow-up email just to help move them along quicker to the next step. In many ways, whether it's with you or with not you, I always feel like, you know, if they don't use me, I want to leave them feeling like, okay, I was here to help. And that way they remember me giving them like a free job description and kind of the process of what it looked like. And I even give them, you know, what most recruiters out there will charge, like what those fees look like, if it's 20 to 30%, how that's cut in the contract, just to give them knowledge too. So whether I'm their girl or not, they kind of leave me, I think, a little more informed. Um, and a lot of my clients have come back to me a year later. It's kind of weird that I don't know why maybe they don't use me in the first round. <laughs> maybe I'm too maybe laid back. There are other bigger companies that are fully structured. And again, I have that structure, but it's probably more relaxed these days. Um, it's probably why I attract a lot more of the California clients, I think, sometimes too. Um, but um, you basically, I think if you leave them with a good memory of you, they might come back a year later and say, hey, we tried this other big firm. It didn't work out. We spent 100000 We need help finding somebody fast. And I love those kind of clients and they really trust me at that point. They almost at that stage, let me run the process for them as an advisor, which I really love because I can really cut through all the BS, so to speak, that they've maybe they've set up such processes that are so hard for a candidate to get through. They lose such great candidates. So I can really streamline that process for them. So if that's another big word, and again, this probably won't all happen the first call. Now I'm just getting into the second follow-up call is the process, 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 right? So if we have the trust and you did the follow-up and you're giving the give the, you know, the free stuff away and you're helping them and you're learning, um, then you want to create that process. And that first step is you know, getting that next call scheduled for them and then walking them through more what the process will look like before you close the contract. Um, and sometimes even after you're negotiating the contract or during, they'll want more process put in place. I have a client that every time I close new contract with her, um, she wants a quick little, um, what's it called? She calls it, it's not the process, but the this, this scope of work, right? It's almost like in, when I used to do construction deals um, or construction um hiring, they were used to have scope of work. So when you deal with contractors, you have a scope of work. So every contract, I'd attach a quick scope of work with the actual dates on the calendar. So it goes off the generic 
kind of boilerplate process. But now I'm like, okay, I'm hiring a team of, you know, 10 recruiters for you. Um, this is a boilerplate and we're going to start here, let's say, you know, January 1. By February 1, we'll have this money going through your process. By February 1, this is where we'll be. And then I would send her weekly updates, right? Because she's kind of very far away from her managers that were hiring the teams. And that's also true for when we do sales teams. Um, so again, you're going to tweak that. It goes back to just customizing it for your client, right? So make a custom plan for your client wherever you are. So I hope this is a lot of information on this Tactical Tuesday call, especially for summer. Usually my brain doesn't even want to go this deep in the summer. And oh my goodness, I'm almost in a half hour, so I'm going to stop. But I just feel like sometimes a lot of you um, need that more level of detail. I know I cover a lot of that detail in our private podcast and the private groups, but I'm not going to be running one of those again um, until later on. So if this can help you now and then get on my mailing list for when I run a group again, if you want to get on for that private training, I can help you with the templates, whatever you need. Um, email, of course, always at hello at headhuntinghousewives.com for more information because I'm going to cut this now to go start my summertime fun because I want to get out of my recruiting mind. <laughs> it's hard for me to do, obviously, um, to enjoy summer. My kids are home and um, we are in June, ladies. So kind of think through this and do the work you got to do. I know you are where you are. So if you're busting your butt, that's fine. You won't always be busting your butt. Um, so put these things in a place to make your life a lot easier as a recruiter, you know, get off the treadmill, so to speak, and just make the process better. So life flows easier for you. If not now, then just be doing this to set yourself up for the future, right? That's always the key. Have that process in place. So have a great Tuesday, my headhunting housewives. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Hey, if you've enjoyed listening to this podcast, you have to come join us over at headhuntinghousewives.com. It's completely free to join. We're there to offer you guidance, support, inspiration. And when you're ready to go a little bit deeper, we're starting a mentorship program in 2Q. If that's for you, you have to email me at hello at headhuntinghousewives.com and let me know who you are and how I can help. Again, that's hello at headhuntinghousewives.com and I look forward to seeing you there.